In January 2009, a person or group named Satoshi Nakamoto uploaded a small piece of free shared software to the internet called the Bitcoin Protocol and asked others to copy and run it on their computer. Think of this program as a free virtual bank for the internet community. Anyone is free to join and use it to send and receive a new kind of virtual coin to and from other account holders. It was driven by a problem people had been trying to crack for 20 years. How to send cash in an electronic form over the internet. The one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash. A method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B without A knowing B or B knowing A. The way in which I can take a $20 bill and hand it over to you. Before Bitcoin, the only way to make electronic payments over the internet was to call your bank or a company connected to your bank and ask them to move the money to the other person. However, over 2 billion people in the world don't even have access to a bank account, so you simply cannot send money to them. No matter what value they have to offer, they are shut out of the internet economy. This is important because access to financial services directly correlates to increases in dignity, liberty, and self-determination. And even those who do have a bank account aren't exactly free to send money to anyone anywhere online. If two governments don't get along, money simply doesn't flow across their borders. Simply put, if you wanted to give a dollar right now to someone via the internet, almost half of the world can't receive it from you. A digital cash would connect humanity economically in a way never before possible, in a way that included everyone. In the same way that uh, cell phone technology allowed entire nations to leapfrog the landline and achieve communications uh, that would be unthinkable, uh, Bitcoin can do the same for banking and finance, and it can empower billions of people around the world. Bitcoin, for the first time, makes possible transactions online that are person to person, without the need for an intermediary between them, just like cash. Satoshi offered a physical analogy for Bitcoin to warm people up to the idea. I didn't make it now. Imagine there was a metal as rare as gold, but it had one magical property. It can be transported over a communication line. Like sending physical cash as a direct message nearly instantly. But Bitcoin isn't a boring gray metal, it's a virtual coin taking the form of a number. At first, these bitcoins had no value at all. They were simply passed around for fun by people who were interested in the idea, like digital tickets to a fair which didn't yet exist. Gradually, hobbyists collected and sold bitcoins for a fraction of a penny just to prove the system could work. Because once bitcoin had any value at all, and therefore a price, it became a powerful social technology. This gave birth to a new layer of internet marketplaces which didn't require or even allow traditional money. A new freedom had emerged. Bitcoin was being used by people who had nothing to do with its creation, and no government could stop it. Though Satoshi was always worried about Bitcoin growing too fast from the start, this was not about making money. It was about freedom of exchange online. This growing public acceptance of Bitcoin and proof that it worked led to a secondary demand for Bitcoin as it became viewed as a safe haven for a portion of their savings, which was outside the hands of any government. So the demand for both transactions on the network and investment in the network pushed the price of one Bitcoin right beside the price of an ounce of gold by December 2013. Gradually, larger and larger institutions adopted Bitcoin as a form of payment, and eventually forward-thinking governments began to recognize it as a legal payment method. I'm interested in coming to learn what is needed to ensure that this innovation can continue. I'm here to testify because I believe that digital currency represents one of the most important technical and economic innovations of our time. Four years later, in December 2017, a speculative wave pushed the price of a single Bitcoin past 10 ounces of gold. But before getting to the method behind how Bitcoin works, the question most people get hung up on is, how can a number have value? Why would anyone in their right mind trade multiple ounces of gold for a number?
Let's rewind for a moment and think about money. Money is how we move value across distance or through time. Within a small trusted group, such as a family, you don't really need physical money. People give each other things of value with the promise to return the favor in the future. So money actually starts as a shared memory. The very oldest written documents we can dig up show we often wrote down a list of promises to each other, known as a ledger. This is what we call digital money, money which takes the form of written symbols or digits. But this kind of written money only works if we trust the people we are making promises with. And so when humans travel to distant regions to trade with people they've never met and may never meet again, they used physical money instead. This allowed them to settle trades immediately with no trust involved. And of all the kinds of physical money we've used throughout history, there is one pattern which emerges. We ended up using some form of treasure, often a rare rock. A typical rock at the beach won't work. Nobody values them because they are so plentiful. But once in a while you will find something more unique. A shiny rock. A tooth. A bone. Humans have a tendency to collect and treasure unique things. The value of these treasures was based on the fact that everyone knew they were rare. Rarity is the value. Remember, if you were alone on Earth, the value of any treasure wouldn't exist anymore. Think of this as symbolic value. It may seem strange to value rarity, but we all exhibit this phenomena beginning as children. We value things that other people have and we don't. It can drive us crazy. It can mean everything. Until we find out there are many copies of the same toy and it's no longer unique. Suddenly others don't value it as much and it becomes worthless garbage. And we do this exact same thing as adults. We value things based on uniqueness or rarity. Nothing to do with their actual utility. Throughout history, you'll see each culture uses their own kind of rare rock as money in their local region. And treasure in one region isn't always recognized as treasure in another. Gradually, as people began spreading around the world, a global treasure emerged based on the rarest of rocks, precious metals. These are the shiny bits people noticed in rocks all over the world. We extracted this shiny stuff by grinding up the rocks, melting them down, and pouring out only the shiny stuff as pure metal. And we give the name precious metals to only the rarest of metals. Iron, for instance, is very useful. Almost everything is built out of it. But it isn't considered precious because there is so much of it around. That's why one ounce of iron is worth a few pennies. People only pay for its utility. Compare this to one ounce of gold, which is worth over a thousand dollars. That's all driven by its rarity. Precious metals are an important form of money because they came to be valued everywhere on Earth. They work as a physical money that crosses all borders. The value of an ounce of gold is not dependent on any one culture. This explains why those in power have always tried to hoard and control gold. It's a form of global wealth. And so history is full of examples of people in power collecting as much precious metal as they could, stamping it into coins with the ruler's face on it, and leaking it into society via wages. Across cultures, history shows that gradually rulers realized the same thing, that the coins they pressed didn't need to be so precious. What was most important about a coin was not the metal content in it, but trust in the number on it. But it was the Chinese who first took this to its logical conclusion and put it into practice in the 11th century, when they created a money supply out of trusted numbers on paper with no connection to gold or any precious metal. It's exactly like what happens at the fair today. Money takes the form of tickets because the Chinese realized that the best way to control gold was to force everyone to sell their gold at the borders for a piece of trusted paper money. 
And like fare tickets, you couldn't go back and cash those pieces of paper in for gold. There was no link between the paper and the gold. Your only option was to spend the paper money in the economy. This was a brilliant scheme. It allowed the rulers to hold all the global money, such as gold, while the people carried a local money that circulated within their borders. Eventually, every country copied this idea. This results in the now modern idea of government-manufactured rare paper, known as fiat money. Paper money which isn't connected or backed by gold or any form of physical value. Its printing is decided by the government who is in charge of controlling the money supply and enforcing its use. As long as people remain confident that our government is strong and secure, they will continue freely to accept and spend its money without questioning the value. That's how we end up with a world full of local fiat currencies, which travel freely within the borders of a given country. Dollars, euros, yen, they are all the same thing. Each country is using its own fare tickets, with no connection to gold or any precious metal. And today we rarely use paper money. Roughly 90% of your money exists only in digital form, so today you mainly use number money, like points. These points exist as your bank account balances, which are stored with a bank in a trusted computer file known as a ledger of accounts, or simply a ledger. The government and banks are in charge of creating, securing, and censoring these numbers in the ledger. And that's digital money. It's just a ledger, plus someone you trust, such as a bank, to keep it up to date and secure. And this leads us back to the problem we face online. Because the internet crosses all borders and acts as a new global community, who is going to make the digital tickets for the internet? And who will we trust to be in charge of them? Bitcoin is the world's first completely decentralized digital currency. And it's the decentralized part of that sentence uh, that is really unique. The key to Bitcoin is the way Satoshi flips the traditional model of trust on its head. Instead of letting a bank control a ledger, you share it with everyone. Anyone in the world can plug in a computer to download and track the Bitcoin ledger, known as a Bitcoin node. This shared file model is more secure than any government or bank ledger could hope to be. Consider when a highly controversial computer file leaks onto the internet. Those in power learn that it was simply impossible to stop, alter, or destroy that file because there are so many independent copies of that file. Bitcoin is one of a growing number of systems that turns this openness of the internet into its security advantage. But a bank isn't just a ledger. It's also the people which validate and update new transactions. A bank is a process. People follow protocol. And so you can think of a bank ledger as a living document. At any moment, it contains the history of all valid transactions, which define the current account balances. Bitcoin automates this banking process with a piece of shared software that all Bitcoin nodes run called the Bitcoin protocol. It does the job of making sure the history of transactions is secured. And so Bitcoin is a piece of shared software which everyone runs together instead of having one trusted computer do it. There is no center to the network, no central authority, no concentration of power, and no actor in whom complete trust must be vested. It's exactly how ants and bee colonies function, which are naturally occurring decentralized systems. In this case, a bee is like a Bitcoin node. They all follow the same rules. But collectively, this results in a hive being built. The hive emerges from the bees following rules. Bitcoin is like a computerized colony where instead of building a hive, they are building a file which tracks the growing history of valid transaction. This file grows in small chunks of new transactions approximately every 10 minutes on average, known as the blockchain. To best understand Bitcoin, you need to follow how transactions get entered into this blockchain. With Bitcoin, all transactions are public. 
So instead of sending a private message to your bank to move a number from one place to another, your computer shouts it on a public internet channel, which all Bitcoin nodes are listening on. Two key things happen once a transaction is announced to the network. First, every transaction should be heard by every Bitcoin node in the network. And secondly, every Bitcoin node must have a chance to vote on whether a transaction was valid or not. To make both things happen, Satoshi did something very clever, known as proof of work. The system slows down the process by which new transactions get verified by including an extra work hurdle between when a transaction is first detected at a Bitcoin node and when it can be validated by the network. As follows. Each node collects approximately 1 to 2,000 new unverified transactions they hear in what's called a block. Next, this block of data is passed through a symbol mixing machine, which scrambles up the data and spits out a short random sequence of symbols associated with that block. It acts like an ID for that block. We call this mixing process a hash function, and we call the random output the hash. Hash functions work in an unpredictable but repeatable way. The same block of transactions result in the exact same hash. But if you change one digit in the transaction block, you get an entirely different hash. And for a computer to perform this hash operation on a block is very easy. It can be done in a fraction of a second. But the reverse operation is very difficult because hash functions are designed to mix the data in a way that makes them practically impossible to reverse engineer. And this is the source of the extra work. Because for every block, the Bitcoin software specifies the form the hash must take, which is a small number the hash must be less than, and is an extremely rare occurrence. And within each block, an extra space is included, for a number the Bitcoin nodes must find, which results in the desired hash format. To find the number which results in the desired hash is like finding a needle in a haystack of numbers. The best a Bitcoin node can do is rapidly guess numbers as fast as they can until they find one which leads to the valid hash format for any given block. And this is what Satoshi refers to as mining. It's a guessing game. The first computer in the network to find a lucky number for a block is said to have mined that block of new transactions. And immediately after mining a block, that lucky node sends it out to their neighbors for confirmation, essentially saying, hey everybody, I won this race, please check that this block contains all valid transactions. And this brings us to the second key rule all Bitcoin nodes must follow. As soon as a Bitcoin node in the network creates or hears about a newly mined block from a neighboring node, it stops and verifies whether the block is valid or not. If the Bitcoin node finds any problem in the block, it simply ignores it and considers it invalid. If instead the entire block appears valid, then the node downloads it to its memory of valid transactions. But instead of simply downloading the block, it actually attaches to the block by calculating the hash of that block and including it within the next block of new transactions they are working to mine. This is how a chain is created between blocks, which we call a blockchain. It creates an information dependency between all blocks. If you change one symbol in any block within a blockchain, that change will propagate forward to the very front. So it locks the history of all transactions in place. And all Bitcoin nodes do this same thing. They either ignore a block if it isn't valid, or they attach to it if it is. Only after every node in the Bitcoin network has attached a block to the end of its blockchain do we consider it as a valid block. This idea of voting on a block by attaching to it is subtle, but very powerful. Because as soon as a node begins mining the next block in a sequence, it changes the growth rate of the chain it's connected to. And so as more Bitcoin nodes work on guessing a given block, it's more likely that it will be found sooner. And so the chain will grow faster as more nodes work on it. And this leads to the key insight behind Bitcoin. 
the true blockchain is the longest blockchain because the honest chain will grow the fastest. And this allows many disconnected people to agree on one truth. Because let's say the majority of nodes believe block A was the most recent valid block, while only a small minority of cheating nodes believe in block B. And to determine which is actually the chain to trust, the nodes simply monitor which chain is growing faster. And because the majority has more collective guessing power, the chain through block A will grow faster than the chain through block B. It's exactly similar to why 10 people rolling dice will hit on snake eyes faster than one person over time. One person might get lucky and hit snake eyes once in a while, but over time the majority will always hit snake eyes more often. And this works because no one computer or entity is more powerful than the majority of computers on the Bitcoin network. For comparison, if Google dedicated all its machines to mining Bitcoin, it would make up less than 1% of the total network power. But this is all based on one important assumption that the majority of Bitcoin nodes will be honest in the first place. Aside from doing it out of goodwill, Satoshi knew there must be a fair economic incentive to motivate as many people as possible to participate in this network. To do this, the Bitcoin protocol also rewards the first node to mine a block with a small payout of the initial Bitcoin supply. Right now, this payout is 12.5 Bitcoins and it's gradually decreasing towards zero, such that by approximately 2140, all Bitcoins in existence will have been released or mined, leading to a precise supply of 21 million Bitcoins which will ever exist. So the system pays itself with the initial supply to grow and secure itself. So Bitcoins come into existence through the Bitcoin miners and then they are spread around to the general public via open markets or directly from person to person. And that's how Bitcoin works. They are numbers that flow through a ledger that everyone tracks together. And to this day, nobody has been able to compromise or attack this system. Even with hundreds of billions of dollars on the line. As regulatory and law enforcement agencies seek to apply existing laws to Bitcoin, they will face the challenge that Bitcoin is not a company with an easily identifiable executive, but instead it's an open source project and a community. The first wave of the internet in the 80s and early 90s resulted in a network which connected humans globally in a way never before possible. Soon after, the second wave of the internet gave birth to massive networks with billions of connected people that were owned and controlled by a single trusted corporate entity via proprietary software. The idea behind Bitcoin and some say the next wave of the internet is to dissolve that border and replace the trusted entity and proprietary software with an open network running free shared software which is available to everyone. And it's based on a new model where the crowd takes control of the software we use instead of a trusted third party. The question left in the wake of Bitcoin is, what's next? What would your reaction be to just a, a report with one recommendation? And that recommendation would be that there be no regulations and that we re revisit this in, say, five years. I think that would be a very good idea. I think there is some room for clarification, clarifying, for example, the tax status for individuals, or at least clarifying the right of an individual to make a choice in the currency they use as a consumer, as entirely equivalent with any other national currency. In the near future, the Bitcoin protocol will also facilitate advanced payment services, and experiments are currently underway to provide additional non-financial services like property management and identity verification.